evolution is considered the keystone of biology. Kind of the theory of evolution holds everything else together. That's because evolution explains the unity of life. So all of the things that living organisms have in common and also the diversity of life. So how we can have such different organisms living on Earth today and in the past. We're going to look at five different videos in this unit. Um, first, we'll look at types of adaptations. I think that's the easiest thing to start with because kind of all the stuff we can see and know about that makes it easier for us to live. Then we'll go into principles of natural selection. So how evolution by natural selection occurs. Then we'll look at evidence of evolution. And then finally, um, patterns of natural selection. And then finally, I should say, speciation. So, and speciation is really where we get to the diversity of life. I want you to think about adaptation as a noun. Okay, so when we think about adaptation, think, oh, an adaptation is a noun. Okay, so not a process, but the end result. So an adaptation is a trait, okay, that's shaped by natural selection. We'll talk about how that happens next. Um, that increases an organism's reproductive success. So basically makes it easier for that organism to survive and reproduce. And when we get into natural selection and how that happens, we'll come back to the idea of adaptations then as well. Um, what we can see here are some, one of the most common adaptations we see here is camouflage. So if we start with the picture over on the left, okay, hopefully you see the insect here that's camouflaged to look very much like a flower. Okay, so we can see its head and thorax and abdomen, even its wings look like petals. Another adaptation of camouflage in insects, we can see this stick insect right here, which doesn't blend in so well on that green leafy plant, but if it was on, you know, think about all of the bushes in your yard right now that don't really have leaves on them yet because it's not late enough in the springtime, but you can see those branches, it would really blend in. And then here's a caterpillar right here that has an adaptation of camouflage to look just like a twig on a branch. Pretty impressive. You can see how all of these adaptations would help these organisms survive because they're less likely to be eaten by their predators or if they're the predator, they can sneak up on their prey more easily. The adaptations that we just looked at on the previous slide are all structural adaptations. So structural adaptations are the things that we can see, the physical structures like antlers on a deer. Okay. Or we all have hey, an opposable thumb, so give yourself a thumbs up. Try to do things without using your opposable thumb. Try writing your name, try eating dinner, try tying your shoes. If you do these things without your thumb, you'll realize they're much more difficult to do. It's a huge adaptation. Um, camouflage, as we just looked at. Mimicry, which is when animals oftentimes look like other animals, and sometimes plants do this too. Um, so they might, you know, like the snake that looks like a poisonous snake, but it's not really. So those are structural adaptations. Behavioral adaptations are behaviors that organisms do. Typically we think about animals, for example, that help it to survive and reproduce. A cat arches its back when it's in threatened because it looks larger. Um, Owls ruffle their feathers. It helps them to keep warm when it's cool. Birds sing songs to find mates to communicate. These are all behavioral adaptations. And then the third type of adaptations are physiological. These are kind of the things that happen within one's body that help, survive, help survival that you're not really aware of. So when it's really cold out, what's the first thing that you feel cold? Your fingers, your nose, your ears because the blood is protecting your internal organs. You can't live without um, your internal organs, like your heart and your lungs functioning, your brain, but you know, if you lose your little toe to frostbite, it's not the end of the world. Oftentimes when we talk about adaptations, we'll realize that certain adaptations, they help with survival, but they also have these negative consequences. One of them we can see with human babies. So if you look at this, you know, sweet little baby down here. Hi, little baby. Totally helpless. If you left a newborn baby alone in the woods, it would not survive. Um, and if any of you have experience with very young children, they can't do anything. This baby right here wouldn't be able to roll over. It can just kind of flop its arms around. It can't feed itself. It can't take care of itself. The reason for that is that humans are born really early. Oftentimes, um, people are referred to the fourth trimester, so the first three months of a human baby's life 
when really they should still be in the womb. They can't do anything. Um, don't really communicate with their parents even that much yet. So pretty useless. Not useless. They're lovely. I, I love my son. But they are, they are helpless. We can say that. Um, the reason that babies are born early, okay, compared to, if you look, for example, this little baby chimpanzee. If you think about most baby animals, they're born and within days, if not minutes, they're up walking around and they function in their society quite early and they could take care of themselves at a fairly early age. Um, human babies are born early for two reasons. One, we have big brains. Okay, These big brains means our skulls are fairly large and that skull needs to be able to exit the mother. So babies can't keep growing for too long because then they wouldn't be able to be born. The other reason is the fact that we stand upright. That is an excellent adaptation because it allows for better visibility um, or better vision scanning, seeing things around, can run faster than chimps or other apes who have to kind of knuckle walk. But it means that the center of gravity in humans is very different. So in chimps, right, we can see right here, here's the center of gravity normally. And when a chimp is pregnant, center of gravity doesn't really change Right, And so this female chimp could stay pregnant for a while and still be able to walk around. For humans, our center of gravity is located kind of in our hips, right over our legs, When, because we stand upright. When a woman is pregnant, as her uterus grows larger and larger and her abdomen swells out with the baby, it compresses the spine, which we can see right here, um, because of the shift of the spine due to the center of gravity. So... A pregnant woman, if you've ever seen someone who's pregnant, you know, like nine months or 40 weeks and ready to give birth at any point, if you ask her how her back is feeling, it's probably pretty sore and she's most likely ready to not be pregnant anymore. I want to leave you with this picture of a beautiful male peacock and thinking about consequences of adaptations. I want you to think about this question, and this is something we'll talk about later on in this unit. Why do male peacocks have these giant, beautiful feathers? I want you to think about how could this adaptation be helpful and how could it be harmful? And we'll talk about why this exists later on.